What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. We're coming to you with some good news after the Falcons beat the Miami Dolphins in yet another close contest. This time, the Falcons came out on top of it by a score of 30-28 to 28 here at Hard Rock Stadium. I'm sitting next to Tori McElhaney. Chris Rim is back at home. We're staring at him through fancy technology. And Chris, watching this game, seeing what transpired, what what was your biggest takeaway from this Falcons victory that brought them to 3-3 three and three on the season? I think, um, oddly enough, it was that Cordell Patterson is, is here to stay. Um, I think when I was reading things and looking at much of the discourse on social media or, or elsewhere, there was the assumption that Cordell Patterson would have some kind of drop-off and that his first five games were like some sort of anomaly, that he was just – playing well, but he got he got 14 carries today. He didn't do as much in the receiving game, but he scored a touchdown. And I think today's game just showed me that he, he's going to be a part of this offense for the full 17 game season and whatever they do after that. And the, the first five games weren't just, you know, a spike in his career. And Tori, uh, what, uh, what was your big takeaway after this one? I think for me, it was that even though the Falcons didn't play a complete game, and I know there are parts of this game that I guarantee you that they would say that they want it back, that they still found a way to win in the end. And and I think they found a way to win through the talents of their playmakers. So you take Matt Ryan's performance, Kyle Pitt's performance, Young Way Koo at the very, very end. I mean, these are all very specific people who really kind of changed the way that this ending happened. And I think it's, it's why we got to the score that we did. It's why the Falcons are walking away at a 500 record right now instead of the alternative. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good spot to sit here because we're starting to see the mindset that Arthur Smith wants to instill in this team, and it's starting to come out and pay dividends late in the fourth quarter. It's that winning mindset. It's that belief that if we get the ball last, we are going to win, and that's going to be essential for this team this season. Uh, and on down the line. We're, we're going to break all that down here on this episode of Falcons Final Whistle. You guys know the format by now. Uh, we're going to break things down over the course of four quarters, five minutes each. And in this one, we're going to talk about that fateful final drive. We're obviously going to talk about Kyle Pitts. I mean, duh. duh. And uh, we, we're each going to pick an MVP from this game. And as we always do, we are going to look ahead to the two NFC South opponents coming up where the Falcons stand. We may or may not use the word playoffs, at least me, just throwing it (laughs) out there and warning you guys. We're we're, going to get to all that after we thank our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, including, yeah, that's right, the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. And now we're going to get started with quarter number one. And the first quarter begins with five minutes talking about that final drive where the Falcons won it with a young way coup, 36 yard field goal. They marched 57 yards on nine plays over the course of two minutes and 27 seconds, the final seconds of this game to secure it without giving Miami the opportunity to return fire. And I I think that was really important and really impressive with how they did it. Uh, Tori, what was your favorite part of that drive? What do you think was the was the catalyst there? So I think the catalyst was obviously the first two plays where you where Matt Ryan hits Kyle Pitts for a gain of 21 yards and then turns around and hits him for a gain of 28 yards, and it, it's like that was that was the moment that you're like, you know what? They're doing this. They're moving down with down the field with ease. It, it felt like, and, and so. That, to me, was a really important catalyst, but I think what got the Falcons into the groove of the drive was actually something that Matt Ryan talked about post game, and he was talking about how they had the ball, and they were inside, you know, probably the 30, and they started running the ball because they had a lot of time left on the clock still. I mean, you didn't want to give Miami the ball back. You really had to think about clock management and and all that kind of stuff, and they ran the ball. They gave it to... Mike uh, Mike Davis for three yards. Patterson, I think, had five yards and then three yards. And they're just kind of punching away and doing what you needed to do in that situation. So I think in terms of that drive, it was both the catalyst of Kyle Pitts, his first two catches of that drive, but then also finishing that drive off 
with the run game being productive when it needed to be. Yeah, and Chris, what was your take on that drive? That The, the Falcons had a two-score lead early in that fourth quarter, and we saw it slip away. Now, we've seen these Falcons come back against the Giants. They, they had that o- offensive drive against the Jets to hold their lead, but they had a big lead, lost it. Uh, what was your takeaway if we include all the context of, of losing that late lead, of fumbling, of having that interception, still finding finding a way to uh, get it done? I think this, this, <clears throat> this drive made me think about uh, the Falcons drive against Washington when they ran the ball. I think they ran, I think they went three and out and they ran the ball and then they lost the game. And after the game, we were talking on here about, you know, should they have done something different in hindsight of 2020? And even Arthur Smith mentioned that maybe the following week, maybe they could have did something different, but something I, I still think about even this week and the weeks following is what Tori mentioned in during that podcast about, you know, execution. And today the Falcons essentially did the same thing while they didn't start the drive running the ball. It was with, you know, two passes to Kyle Pitts and then they ran the ball. Um, There was a lot of time left and they could have, they could have, you know, went three and out earlier and then left a lot of time on the clock for the Dolphins. But the difference between this game and the Washington game was that they executed. So I think sometimes looking at different games, you can see how, play calls aren't necessarily bad, just the execution didn't happen there. And today, the, I think the execution happened, and that's what stood out to me on, on this drive. Something that I'll add to that, too, is I think it's really interesting when you look at the game-winning drive, or the the drive that iced the game in London against the Jets. The very first play from, from the line of scrimmage on that drive was a long pass to Kyle Pitts. Same exact thing happened with this drive. It's like the fact that Kyle Pitts is the guy that you go to when you need a big jolt – I mean, that says something a lot about Kyle Pitts, and I know we'll get into to talking more about Kyle in, in the second quarter, but I think that's really important to kind of talk about. If we're talking about comparing drives, the fact that it's a consistent thought that, like, you know what, we're going to start these drives off with a big play from Kyle, I think that's really, really telling how much this coaching staff believes in their number four overall draft pick. Yeah, and they and they combined that with that hard running and that tough first down that they didn't get against Washington. I also think that if we're looking at this drive in a greater context, and obviously we can't ignore the fact that in recent seasons the Falcons have not done well in the fourth quarter. I, I tried to write uh, on the website for, for my postgame column that, hey, that it's – natural for you to want to go back to that instinct but you have to judge what this team has done and we're still it's a growing sample size but they've been in four close games they've come through three times and I think that that's a positive thing and it's because of the mentality that Arthur Smith is is uh, trickling down throughout the course of this team and it's Matt Ryan projecting it outward to the other players. I think it's a combination of good of good play calling, of, of, of good execution, and a belief that even if things don't go right, it's not here we go again. It's what can we do to reverse course. And that's what we're going to end with on the first quarter. As the second quarter begins, we're going to spend five minutes talking about the number four overall pick, Kyle Pitts. He had a pretty good day. He did what I recall, yeah. the tune of seven catches for 163 yards on eight targets. Several of those catches involved just one hand. Yes. Uh, others came in massive moments. This guy continues to build and impress more and more and more. Now, there was a lot of hype about him coming out of the draft. He's starting to live up to it now. I, he's been really impressive, not only in what he's th- – the raw numbers, but in how he's been able to do it. Uh, Tori, what's been the most impressive thing for you about Kyle Pitts in this game and uh, throughout the course of his first six professional games? Yeah, Kyle Pitts and the evolution of Kyle Pitts is going to be just a marker of this season. I think we knew that coming into this season, but to actually see it happening live and to see the steps that he's taking as an individual, but also to see the steps taken – I guess when you think about like with Arthur Smith and with Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan's trust in Kyle Pitts, Arthur Smith play calling for Kyle Pitts, all all of these things kind of coming together in step with one another, I think is so crucial to the, to, to this offensive success. And and so when I was thinking about all of this and post game, my, my takeaway was simply that 
Kyle Pitts is as advertised. Everything that we thought he was going to be through the draft process and through all of those evaluations and all everybody talking about Kyle Pitts, he is what everybody said is that he was going to be, and we're seeing that play out in real time, and I think that's really exciting as you're going through this. And I thought post-game Arthur Smith, I asked him, because he was talking a lot about like the mindset of Kyle Pitts, and I asked him, I was like, can you just speak more to that? You keep bringing it up. And he, he, I thought he had such a good anecdote about how this is what you're seeing right now is who they expected Kyle Pitts to be. And and even in their pre-draft evaluations and in those early conversations that they had with Kyle Pitts, this was something that they expected from him. And the fact that he's kind of taking all of this in stride and you see him getting better and better and building and building every single week as every game passes, it's really fun to watch. Chris, what about this game in in particular did you like about about what Kyle Pitts did? Do you have a f- favorite play, favorite moment, anything really stand out, just whether they threw to him twice in that final drive, anything at all? Yeah, I, I think if there was like a Heisman moment or that type of thing, <laughs> you know, people say you, you have a Heisman moment, um, that this was this this game for Kyle. I thought last week was the coming out party, but this this was that today. Like he did everything um, from the way he ran routes to the the different the different way he attacked defensive backs and linebackers. Uh, you on the broadcast they talked about how he looked like a veteran and the way he would shove a defensive back and use his muscle without drawing a flag. And then in the fourth quarter to start the drive, twenty one year old lined up against a two-time or first team all pro. I don't know how many times all pro Xavier Howard and you, you know, cook Xavier Howard <laughs> yeah. open and, and, you know, catch the ball for 28 yards or however much that was. I think that that right there solidifies you um, as, you know, everything that, that people expected you to be for you to go against a guy like that, you know, with no, no fear attacking him. And it was a great ball by Matt Ryan, by the way. But that that was a play that stuck in my mind. Like, OK, he, he's here. Yeah, that was really cool, too. And I think what Matt was talking about post game was also really interesting, where he was talking about how May Amy was playing a lot of man to man coverage. And I just can't help but think, like, you know, coming in what Kyle Pitts is, you know, how hard he is to guard in a man to man situation. And I think Atlanta just loved it, as we can see from the 163 receiving yards that Kyle Pitts has. If you're going to put Kyle Pitts in a one-on-one man-to-man situation, like that's that's tough. It is. But I think I think too, though, if you're, I mean, if you're Miami, you might be thinking, you know, this is our guy, and this is not. That is know, true. And and then our guy is not any guy. This is, <laughs> our guy is one of the best defensive backs cornerbacks in the league and i believe there was there was safety help too yeah, yeah there, there was, was. <laughs> so, they, so they they helped him out and it still wasn't enough so so like you said kyle is just he i think i think like you said they underestimated him and he's just more than advertised <laughs> yeah he, he's been incredible and as we wrap up this second quarter we can leave you with a quote from matt ryan post game when he just said, I think he's getting uh, more comfortable and he's showing that in the way that he is performing. I give him a lot of credit. Here's the part that I like. There's no blink in his game. When the game's on the line or it's an important situation, he just goes out there and executes the same way he does every other snap. So not only is he talented, freakishly so, but the guy can perform in the clutch. And that is what makes you a next level talent. And uh, man, we could talk forever about sure uh, about Kyle Pitts, but it's time to move on. We're on to quarter number three, and it's time to pick our MVPs. There are a couple of options. Everybody knows what one of them is, the guy that we just talked about, Kyle Pitts. But a lot of players contributed to this victory. Uh, MVPs, where are we at here? Uh, anybody want to go first? Sure, I'll do it. So yeah. I can, wow, so wow. I can, you slid in there real quick. You're like, you know what? Right. I'm going to go first. And you know what? <laughs> and it's not to take Kyle Pitts, which right. seems like the obvious move. Right. Uh, and we didn't discuss these ahead of time, but I'm going to go ahead and take the quarterback. Even nice. though Matt Ryan wasn't perfect t- um, uh, this afternoon, he was 25 for 40 for 336 yards, two touchdowns, and a pick. We know he had the lost fumble. He was cruising early. He was. And had a little uh, – he had a bit more trouble late. But what I like about it 
is quarterbacks make mistakes, but this guy was unfazed. And he talked about that post game that, hey, man, bad things happen. He went back to his rookie year where he threw five picks and the Falcons still won. Yeah. <laughs> so he's got that basis of, uh, of, of knowledge, but he came in confident. If he's not confident in that final drive, they don't win. Right. And uh, as Chris pointed out, the, the guy threw some dimes. So was he perfect? No. But was he good enough to get the Falcons a win today? And did he help them respond late? Yes, he did. That's why he gets my trophy. Also, the quote, one of the quotes of the night came from Arthur Smith when he was asked about Matt Ryan, and he legit said he's criminally underrated wow, as what a, a quarterback term. in this league. And I loved that quote. Fantastic quote from Arthur Smith. And then I was selfish yet again because I'm going to steal it for my Monday call. <laughs> I didn't even offer that to anybody else. I'm just mean that way. Uh, other MVPs. Chris, who do you got? Uh, it's tough for me to choose, but I think – I would probably say maybe Jalen Hawkins just because I thought or I, I'm kind of torn between him or, or Ada because I think they just both what they both of their plays in the game uh, were just momentum killers. Like uh, Miami was moving down, about to score, um, about to take extend their lead. I think it was extend their lead maybe to 10, 10 to three mm-hmm. um, yeah. when, when Two or through that pick in the back of the end zone to Jalen and back to back weeks for him uh, with interceptions. Then I loved his his post game interview. He just kept saying, I did it for the squad. Did it for the squad. Yeah. He said, I asked him a question. I, I swear he said, I do it for the squad like three times in a row. It was great. Yeah, I heard it so many times. It sounded like a, a rap song or something. <laughs> that, that's, that was great. And then, you know, at a blocking, blocking the kick, that that's big time. You know, the, the the Falcons won by two. The the kick, you know, you get three points for a field yeah. goal. So that was big time. And I thought I thought those two plays were momentum killers. I'm sure being there, the energy was probably sucked out of the stadium when those plays happened. So th- those two would be my MVPs. Nice, Tori. What you got? Um, well, the guy who won the game for the Falcons, Mr. Youngway Koo. I mean, I feel like you can't talk about this game and not bring his name up and. Here's the thing, and I'm going to get into this in my notebook tomorrow because I, like, wrote – literally, when Koo ran out there for the 36-yard field – well, it was 31, and then it turned into 36 uh, after the false start, but I digress. Um, When he ran out there, I legit wrote in my notebook, Koo's got this. Like, I felt really good about the Falcons winning that game when they – got it into like you know the the, around the 30 yard line I was like all right yeah this is happening and it was great because after the game we're talking to Arthur Smith and he made the comment that I thought was so great Arthur Smith was on fire after the game he had a lot of really good quotes um but he said he was like you know sending Youngway out there he was like I my heart rate wasn't skyrocketing I wasn't nervous he was like it was like just calling a another boring play in like the middle of the second quarter that you know may not mean all that much he was like I my heart rate was not up when I had to send him out there and I think that is so awesome when you have that opportunity to send out your kicker and feel as confident as you do when you send a guy like that out there and the fact that it's young way and we all so many Falcons fans like know his story and, and I just think it's it's just really nice why it's do just, they know his story uh, well, somebody he, wrote some feature about yeah it, that right? was a uh, Chris Rim <laughs> um, shameless, plug. <laughs> shameless plug for the for the long form feature about young way coup um, but but I mean he did it against the Giants he did it again today I, I just think it's it's really really great and I know Matt Ryan said after the game he's had in the over the course of his career, he's had many, many kickers that he has felt confident getting into field goal range and being able to come out with the win. And he said, "Young way's no different." I'm so proud of all three of us that nobody chose Kyle Pitts after spending five minutes talking about well, the we obvious him, one. We gave him an entire quarter, right? So mm-hmm. technically, if he's like MVP one, everybody else is like the next rung down, right? Plus, we were going to say choose someone other than Kyle Pitts, but we didn't do that. This we week. didn't yeah. do that. We yeah. should have. Should it's have. Fine. It's fine. Aaron. The rundown. <laughs> my, yeah, that's definitely my bad. <laughs> definitely. All right, we are we are overtime. We are moving on to quarter number four, and we're looking ahead in quarter number four. Now that the Falcons are five hundred at three and three, they have two huge divisional games coming up next week at home against the Panthers, where Arthur Smith has said they have got to play better at Mercedes Benz. They haven't done that this year. Followed by what could be. A shockingly huge game against the rival Saints in New Orleans the following week if the 
uh, if the Falcons continue to win. And here's a crazy thing that nobody did uh, about the Falcons in 2020. We just typed in NFL playoff picture in reference to the Falcons. Yeah. I know it's we're not even at midseason. We get that it's too early and all those types of things that you can say. But they're on the bubble guys that somehow they're on the bubble somehow they're in it now yeah we can run that that Jim Mora quote playoffs yeah okay look we're not going down that road but they're in better position they're in decent position and it can get better if they continue to play well yeah how pivotal is this stretch coming up oh my gosh these next two weeks are very important for the Falcons I I think that one I do think that the Carolina game is a is a winnable game and I think if you're the Falcons and you can, you're playing at home, you're coming off a win, you know, you're arguably playing the best that you have. You know, it it, it wasn't going to be any worse than it was in Week One, so there it, you could only go up. So I I do say I do add the caveat of that, but you go into this game coming up on Sunday against Carolina, and if you beat Carolina, and then you're looking ahead to the Saints, that game and the narrative around that game changes immensely than I think what we were looking at even two weeks ago. Um, so this is really this is a really, really important two-week stretch for this team. Do you think this team, Chris, is kind of ready to, to, to keep this good thing going? I, I think the, the obvious argument – against what the Falcons have done recently is look at who they've played. Right. right, and there has been a lot of inconsistencies, and these are, you know, one-possession games. Right. So th- you do take all of that with a grain of salt. Yeah, so how do you, Chris, evaluate what you've seen over the course of the last three-slash-four games and then uh, and then how this team can kind of build on that and, and move forward against, I know Carolina's struggling, but still a better competition coming up? Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. I think it's hard to assess where they are as far as how how good the Falcons are, just because of who they just because of their schedule. Uh, the the they played. I think the Buccaneers are the, the the only team that they've played so far who I think is considered you know one, a better team in the league. And mm-hmm. and um, I I thought they did all right in that game, and the score doesn't really reflect how well they played. So I think these next two games, I think specifically more so against the Saints, because without Christian McCaffrey, the Panthers are a much different team. I think specifically against the Saints, like Tori mentioned, if they do get the win um, next week, the narrative around that game will definitely be um, become more important. And and I think I think against the Saints, and then even following those games, I think we'll learn a lot about how good this team really is. Because so far, you've beaten the Dolphins, who have one win, um, the the Giants, who have two, two wins, right. the Jets, who have one win and just the Patriots just put 54 on them today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, so it's, uh, I, <laughs> I think we have to, I think we'll learn about them through. Cause they, just looking past those games, it's the Panthers, the Saints, the Cowboys, the Pats. So yeah, this you, is a big run. So you'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot. Yeah. And I, I think that that's why it, it's fair to be excited. It's fair to temper it and continue to try to evaluate this team logically. The one thing that I would say about it is that each time you win one of these close games, I think you build an element of confidence that you can perform. Now, I'm sure that they're that they're hearing just exactly what 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 we're saying is that they haven't beat anybody big yet, but they're not one in six right now. They're not where the Dolphins are, and they're yeah. in a spot where they have executed well at times with still so much more left mm-hmm. to accomplish. If you look at it, and I think Jalen Hawkins said it well that they know. Oh or yeah. Maybe it was uh, Foyet. Like they no, no, know that Jaylen. they have. They- yeah, Jalen was like, we we're well aware that we have things that we got to clean up. Like, and I think Arthur Smith has said it a bunch, and I know Matt Ryan even said this past week in his availability before this game was. He was like, we're striving for more consistency. They're well aware of the consistency issues, and I think the fact that they're aware of it and they're like, this is something we need to get better at in, I think that's that's really good that they're verbalizing that, I think. Yeah, and if, if they're continuing to, as Arthur Smith says, get one step better and one step better, then they should be competitive in these games. They can they have performed well in the clutch, three out of the last four games, and I think all those things are key as we move forward. And we are moving forward here with the end of the fourth quarter. And that's going to do it for another episode of the Falcons Final Whistle. We are getting out of here. It's getting late. It's freezing cold in this 
Here's Hard the Rock thing. Stadium press box, the, freezing. The, we're in Miami Gardens, Florida right now, and outside it is sweltering, like just so hot. But in this room that we are in, it you could hang meat in here. It is <laughs> freaking freezing in here. I am shivering. Chris, uh, how is it at uh, your spot? A nice 72, 68? Yeah, it's 74. I think. 74? <laughs> Good God, that's hot. <laughs> I have I have the 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 window open, so it's like bring. It's not. I don't think that's correct. I think it's like this area is seventy four, but over uh, there it's probably, it's probably like sixty eight. Got to be so cool, calm, collected, just like the Falcons. We are uh, <laughs> we are bouncing here uh, on this episode of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. So you all know what to do. You've heard me say it before. Head over to Spotify or iTunes and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating and a nice review if you wouldn't mind. You can also get this podcast on YouTube or at AtlantaFalcons.com. Uh, join us on the regular. Submit questions to one of us via via social media and uh, engage with the pod. We love hearing from you and what you like, what you don't. So, anyway, we are out of here until next week. Yeah, we'll see you at home. Mercedes-Benz Stadium. What you up? Know it. Talk to you then. <laughs>